We're going to do a shock clinic today, not on building kits and not on painting, but how to assemble kits for painting. You find the instructions for some kits, in this case strictly a schematic, other kits like the Walpus Conestone series, there's brief instructions, but there aren't really any painting instructions. If you look at this kit, the kit was designed to create a building. The building makes no provision in the building for floors. There's no foundation or floor. It just sits on itself. The building comes raw plastic, unpainted. What we're going to talk about is how to assemble a kit in modules so that they're easily paintable. What we've gone to now is we have Walther's Conestone planing mill. As you can see, it's started out red plastic. There's been some modifications here. What we've done to this model, at this point, it still sits on its base, on the floor. What comes with this thing is about a 60 thousandths plastic foundation that goes around the edge, which disappears when you set it onto the scene. We haven't done anything here to the foundation yet, but what we've done is we've taken some 60 thousandths plastic and we've put a floor in the building. We've put some gussets here and here and down the sides to hold this. Because this building is going to be visible, we've added petitions on the first floor, an office here, a machine shop, and a loading area there. On the second floor, because we've got the visibility issue, we've added some timbers and some supports to give the building some sort of an interior. We've also added lighting. This piece here is strictly structural and to hold the lights. This piece, the square tubing, functions as a chimney, which will be duplicated on top of the building, and allows the wiring to come out and down through the base of the building. This building, as it sits, does not allow for any train, boxcar type of loading, nor does it allow much in the way of truck loading. What we've done is we've taken here a piece of half inch plywood and we've created a base. We've trimmed that base with brick all the way around. We've used mitre joints on the corners and we've run this thing through a sander to make sure that it's perfectly smooth after the contact cement that holds it down is dried. Now, if we take our wires and run them through our base. A building that sits on a base, a base that's the right height to put box cars along here trucks of any kind at the loading docks on either end, and we've got a building that looks like it'll fit into our New England locale a lot easier than something that sits right on the ground. You notice with our sub-assemblies, one of the things that we've done is that everything in this sub-assembly can be painted white. It's been prime gray and then painted white. In this sub-assembly, we, we primed it, the floor area with the gray, we put our brick on, and we painted it on off-red. By designing our sub-assemblies this way, we ease the painting process, and we avoid having to brush paint much of anything when building a kit. We've done the same thing with the roof. If you notice, we assembled the roof before we painted it. We made sure it fit before we painted it, and then we painted it. Color, as you can see, is not a lot different from what the kit came painted, but the painting has eliminated the plastic sheen, and we've got something that looks relatively uh, aged, little weathering on here, a little rust and something like that will help but we've got something that's a good base for applying our weathering. The window sub-assemblies, painting windows by hand, is for the birds. What I've done here 
since the only part of these windows that's going to show is either from the inside the face here or from the outside this material the edges are not going to really show I painted all of these windows and doors on the casting spews they can be cut afterwards to be fitted on the structure we had in this case added two doors cut out of the sides here and stolen these from another kit so these I had painted on the casting spews but they are cut down with the bases cut off of them so that they'll blend right in on the side of the structure. We've added a few things to this kit if we take and go back to our idea that we wanted this kit to be able to have box cars and truck trailers and things like that right up to the platforms. I'm doing this at an awkward angle, but we'll get it on there. Okay. So we have built platforms. And again, these platforms were framed with styrene plastic, but they were built in only the one set of sub-assemblies and pieces that required white paint were put together. And we've done the same with a wider platform to go on the back end, and we've got a small truck platform on here. What we've also done is we've cut our roofs to fit the different pieces, and we've pre-painted those. We've taken our deck material, and our deck material has had holes cut in it to fit around the post and a separate piece to go on the front side of the post so that this too could be separately painted and not have to hand paint this thing around those posts and around the white paint that's already there. It does make life easier. And you can see we've done the same thing with our side platform and for our smaller platform in the back. a brief discussion here of the treatment of wind window material. With this kit we have some relatively heavy, about 40 thousandths thick, clear styrene material that came with the uh, kit that will fit nicely into the back side of, of the window frames when they're put in the building. Uh, in this case we want these things to be clear for the whole window so that people can see the upper interior of this building and that they'll be able to see the interior on the lower levels. Our solid doors will limit the viewing in the loading area, but people will be able to see because of the lighting into the office, the machine shop, and the upstairs where this dowel mill, which is what we've turned this planing uh, mill into, is uh, the real business end of things happens up here where they make dowels and wood turnings. So we'll be using this. We might want to put a shade or something on the two windows in the office, but the rest of it we pretty much want open to see. But you might not always want to do that in your structures. One way, if you don't want to show the interior on a building that's relatively close up and there's no shades in the windows, is to take a piece of thin window material, five thousandths, ten thousandths, and spray paint the back of it with gloss black, uh, and that will give you the illusion of glass because it's shiny on the outside, but it's blackened on the inside, uh, and people assume that the lights are out and no one's home. Another option is to take the same material, and what we do with it is we put masking tape on one side of it. And after we mask the material, we paint it with a nice neutral shade color. In this case, I believe this is Depot Buff. Concrete works well. Off-white, uh, grays, uh, even dark green. In the old, old, uh, older days in commercial buildings, they used dark green shades because the properties of white shades, the light kind of shone through them, and they used the odder colors. Uh, in the more modern age, you'll see a tendency towards white, beige, and things like that. But what we did, was we painted whatever color you want your shades on here and what I've done is I've used inch and a half tape 
so that I can slit it down the middle and slit it down the middle here and get two rows of windows out of it. Now, we paint with it masked like this the color that we want the shades. And then we pull the masking after the paint is nearly dry. You don't want to wait till it's completely dry because it may peel the paint. But pull the masking, let it dry further, and then come back and spray paint the back after the masking has been removed with black paint. And then we can take and we can cut right down here. And this can be the bottom, the black can be the bottom half of our window. And we can cut down the middle here. And the top can be the shades pulled halfway down. Or if you want them a third of the way down, you can adjust accordingly. Uh, if you have problems, that you, you get a little bleeding under your tape, remember sometimes if you don't do, do these halfway, the mullion will color, cover any bleeding that there would be uh, between the shades. And as long as the, the areas behind the mullions, you don't have to worry about that bleeding. Let me talk briefly about putting some additional detail on the outside of the building. One of the things by raising the foundation we caused the need for some steps here. What we've done here is we've found some old siding, sidem wooden steps, which is now Alpine models, I believe. <clears throat> we've cut them down with the radial arm saw because they were about three quarters of an inch longer. It was a loading platform. We've taken some Central Valley railings, drilled them with a pin vise, and put our four holes, bent the straight railing around the corner, cut it off and taken the section of the uh, uh, stair railing and put it here and then crazy glued it together. We painted this with our concrete paint before we put the railing on. We put the railing on and then we brush painted the railing. Uh, I didn't do any fancy measuring. I kind of used the centers that were there from the railing and just drilled the holes to match. Another thing on buildings is if we're going to customize the buildings at all, we need to talk about signage. You can make sign, custom signs on a, on a printer, if you have access to a, a computer printer, with any variety of font sizes and lettering styles. Uh, I picked one here, a nice bold, uh, I think it was called Rockwell or something like that. It wasn't a, a, a a Roman because we tend to overdo those things. You want to vary your lettering styles among your buildings to uh, give it some variety, uh, but there are some that are more common here in uh, New England than uh, that are used in, our, used in other parts of the country. What I chose to do was I didn't want to take a big piece of decal paper and use it to make three signs. And so I printed mine out on paper. I had in this case because I wanted a long sign to do it in a landscape format rather than letter format. And I cut the signs out. I took a piece of 60 thousandths plastic, cut the appropriate size that would frame this thing nicely, cut the thing on two sides, used spread uniformly spread white glue on this thing, and then lined up the sign and pressed it down. And then I flipped it over, made sure that I had the thing the same side up on both sides of the sign, and did the same. I trimmed these, allowed them to dry. In the meantime, I took some 125 thousandths by 40 thousandths uh, plastic, uh, carefully held it and sprayed it black without spraying my fingers, and then came back and crazy glued these pieces on the bottom here and on the top of here and chopped them off with a number 18 blade and then did the same thing to cap the ends. It's just an easy matter of brush painting to touch up the ends after you've cut the uh, plastic and you've got a sign which will go on the roof of this building. And this was a very common signage trick here in Maine. They wanted to get their name up there where everybody could see it. Uh, one of the more <coughs> famous ones is uh, was in Bryant Pond. There was a big sign at least 40 feet long. It was in the shape of a post, uh, post pen that advertised a post pen mill there right on the side of Route 26. We also took and made a similar sign, uh, small uh, font size, so that it will go across the street side of the building here. So we've taken care of some of the exterior details. Another thing that will be added 
is we'll need to add the chimney that protrudes through the roof at the appropriate location. The other thing, if you notice this Walther's kit, they must have uh, meant for everybody to use the outhouse because there's not a single bathroom vent that's provided with the kit. Uh, your bathrooms, depending on where they are in the building, uh, dictate the location of the vents. The other thing that's completely missing off this kit, which we might have to do something about, is that apparently everybody that works here uh, works by kerosene lamps, and there's no power equipment in there because there's no electrical service on this building. That's a common overlooked uh, feature on uh, models, and uh, <clears throat> it's one thing that uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, styrene tubing and uh, a few little pieces of squares and rectangle pieces that, and a little silver paint that you can duplicate a, a service entrance and it will add to the appearance in your building. And that's about it for the exterior details that we plan. Uh, one of the side things with the, the uh, not necessarily a side thing, but one of the features of many buildings is auxiliary structures. In this case, we have a dust bin which if you read the instructions that come with this kit, you're supposed to have a pipe going over here through the roof, and they have this thing that covers the end of the, the uh, uh, pipe that is unlike anything that I've ever seen before. Uh, I decided that I didn't want to do that, and what we will probably do with this kit is we will bring the dust bin around to one end of the building, and we'll connect it through the side of the building with a piece of tubing. Uh, whatever uh -huh. distance, we haven't cut this yet, we haven't painted it, whatever distance is needed to put this appropriately on the layout. Okay. We're going to talk briefly about detailing interiors see here that we've placed some of the machinery in the upstairs with the turning room with the dowels or the uh, wood products are turned are, are made. Talk here a little bit about how those particular machines were made. We needed about a dozen of them, ten of them, whatever, and they get a little bit pricey if you go to the hobby store and buy ten pieces of machinery. So what we did was we took some blocks that were cut half inch square and about three quarters of an inch long, sanded them a little bit, and we found some old metal coupler pockets and crazy glued those on the end of the blocks so that they give the appearance of some sort of a stand and the wooden part is probably the cover. Uh, if we wanted to get fancy we could put hinges and handles on here so that they'd be loading platforms or loading doors I mean where people would uh, fill the machine with raw materials and hopefully uh, dowels or wood turnings would spit out the other end. Now to operate in a dust free environment here we've got the hood over this turning area and we've got a uh, vacuum pipe to suck the wood chips and the sawdust away. The pipe is the leftover casting spews from the kit. Uh, we've painted these uh, foundation and then painted them a dark green and placed them in the building. Uh, one of the other things we're going to do to liven up the area up there is we've got a, some Kibri details with uh, the little pallet jacks. Uh, we've got some uh, containers that you'd store the finished product in. We've got some uh, bins that the raw materials come in. We may take some shot pieces of wood and stick them in there so the person loading the machine will have a materials. We've got a few pallets in there. You can see them down here in the foreground, and that will about finish the detail with our machines upstairs. We've also got our office furnished here. We'll have, we've got room in there for a couple of desks. We have filing cabinets. If you notice, this is probably after the Second World War, and we've bought surplus file cabinets, navy gray, army green. Uh, by using the different colors, you get the impression of what they are. If it was just one mass of green or gray, you wouldn't necessarily feel that they were file cabinets. We've got a table and some chairs here for Micah, the new thing right after the war. And of course, this is being an executive office, we have a couch. We're going to lightly stock our machine shop. We have a lathe and a milling machine, and we've got a cabinet here. 
these will probably be about all that people will see through the three windows of the uh, machine shop anyway. Uh, we're going to put a little platform detail here. We've got some uh, uh, dollies and we've got some barrels. The other thing that we thought was our crew on a nice day would like to go out and sit on the back porch and eat, eat lunch on some benches. So we're going to provide some lunch benches here. Uh, that about covers the interior detail. Talk a little bit about adhesives. This is plumber's cement. Uh, the value of something like this, even though it has a monstrous, which I probably applicator, is that if you're bonding large areas, like in this case we bonded a brick to the side foundation. This gives you the ability to put the cement on and the cement won't dry before you pick up the piece of material and get it on. So this is good for when you want to work with a slower cement. A lot of this, the cementing that was done on the structure was done with this Plastistrux cement. This is a relatively fast drying but not super fast drying uh, plastic solvent cement. It will melt your corners of the building together. It will help you put your gussets and your floors in. The next faster cement is this Amberoid Pro Weld. 10 ax is another product that's similar to this. And that's good if you're doing things like you're working on a flat space and you want to bond these joints on the top of this or you want to bond these little pieces, the, the, the diagonal braces. And most of this was put together with that type of cement. It's also good if you're working with something like this dust collector and you just want to drop in each corner because it has great capillary action and it sucks right in there and it doesn't leave globs on the model. The last thing we used is the ACC, which is good for working with different types of materials. And with the accelerator, if you're working on something like trying to bond these two pieces of roof together, and the piece is slightly warped, you can put the ACC here, hold it like this, and then take your accelerator and just zap it. And within five seconds, it's bonded. Uh, the nice thing about this accelerator is it completely dries off the thing and doesn't stain anything if you're using wood or something like that. Um, so it's a real handy thing to have when you need it. It's something that you don't feel like hold, holding it for four hours while it dries. originally to be a video clinic. However, when I started looking at the number of things that I'd have to transport to the uh, club meeting, I decided that perhaps it would be better if I did this as a video so that I can show you more of the examples of detail. We're at the layout here in my home. And this is not a building detail, but it adds to the scene. As you can see, there are a number of pieces of building details which I've taken here including a bathtub, a golf sign, some barrels, other assorted pieces of building material, and created a dump. And you can see that you don't have to be particularly organized. And one thing I've done here with all of this stuff is I've given some of it a coat of rust. We'll take a look at one of the buildings and look at a couple of things that have been done here. We have a shadow box effect here. What I've done is I've taken uh, and built a box-like structure behind the inside of the building. Before it was glued to the outer wall, I painted it black. In effect, it creates depth, even though the distance here is about an inch deep. The doors, which are overhead roller-type doors, are simulated by taking a piece of dowel and cutting it lengthwise. In this case, the loading platform is a solid block of pine, and the step has a wire handle on it. The other details, commercial details, which have been added to the scene. The boiler house in the rear. Chimney was placed in the boiler house, which is a solid block of wood and merely papered. 
but all it is is a piece of copper pipe. Another little trick here is to use instead of posts to hold up a roof, cables or chain. Also they used iron rods in the old days to do this. Propane dealer, what we did here was we took some Central Valley stair stock, uh, there's some plastruck for the frame of this thing and a kitchen spatter screen was the walkway that is angled up there and the one that's flat. The loading tube next to it, all it is is a piece of wire which has been bent uh, looking at what was at one of the local propane plants, a piece of uh, uh, wire insulation stuck on the end of it and a doodad stuck on the end of that to represent the coupling. The point with the engine facility is not the complexity of what was done here in terms of uh, materials. What makes it look complex is the fact that there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of things thrown in here, pieces and parts. Uh, these mostly came out of my scrap box uh, were leftovers from other projects. You see the rail over there was cut up into scale 39 foot lengths and stacked. Only the outside pieces of the rail are full length. The interior pieces are little shot scraps that I had left over. And you take this stuff, everything needs to be rusty, it looks to, needs to be used, and it needs to be piled, and you need the weeds and, and really thing, trash things up. Uh, this is before the cleanup days of cleanup and worry about pollution. It's been brought into the 20th century with a rather cheap plastic dish that I don't have any idea of its origin, but I picked it up someplace and there it sits. Again, you left over pieces from your kits. The doors here are sitting there. You've got leftover ties. Uh, these were purchased, these wheels. The, I guess Tishy Train Group puts them out. Uh, and they really add to the scene with that overhead crane. The oil company kit, when it came from Walther's, was not in this configuration. The other thing that adds to this that didn't come with the kit is the Central Valley walkways and ladders and things of that nature. Because most of these facilities did have roof, did have some sort of access to the tanks. And that was not modeled in the original kit. Lastly, we have the infamous Wiffle Ball a baseball bat smokestack that goes with the paper mill. Thank you for watching Train Time.